Peter said to him, Since you have become the interpreter of the elements and the events of the world, tell us what is the sin of the world? The teacher answered, There is no sin. It is you who make sin exist when you act according to the habits of your corrupted nature. This is where sin lies. This is why the good has come into your midst. It acts together with the elements of your nature so as to reunite it with its roots. Then he continued, This is why you become sick and why you die. It is the result of your actions. What you do takes you further away. Those who have ears, let them hear. The statement of Peter is interesting when he says, Since you have become the interpreter of the elements and the events of the world, tell us what is the sin of the world. You can see here that Peter is having some authority issues with Jesus. He is using these words in a way that he does not want to accept Jesus fully. He is not referring to him as the teacher. He's not referring to him as an awakened one, a realized one. He's merely calling him an interpreter of the elements of the events of the world. And also he says it in a way, since you have become an interpreter, tell us what is sin. And we'll see further along that Peter has severe authority issues. He is short tempered. He is not understanding what is happening around him. He's expecting something altogether different to a point where it makes you wonder why is he even there? He's a total misfit. And Peter is an extraordinarily important character to understand because everything that we recognize as mainstream Christianity is built on his understanding of Jesus. The basic structure of Christianity draws its ideas from Peter apart from the Jewish scriptures. It is ancient Judaism and Peter's masculinity combined with Roman authority is what we recognize as Christianity now. Mary Magdalene's Christianity is totally different. It is spiritual. It is mystical. It is a way of knowing, a way of understanding, which is where we get the Gnostic Christianity from. Now, most people have not even heard of the term Gnosticism. They think it is another sect of Christianity, just like so many other independent small groups that have moved away from the main Christianity, the Catholic Christianity. For a long time, Gnostics were regarded as heretics. They do not worship Jesus like the way Catholics do. They do not accept the Catholic doctrine. They have a totally different way of interpreting his life. Now, it turns out it is the mainstream Christianity that is the heretical group that moved away from original Jesus movement. And the split happens right here. 
it begins with Peter. And when Peter branches off, he leaves the main Jesus movement. Now, how do you separate a deviation, an aberration from the main thing? Not based on its size, not based on how popular that aberration is, but at the most fundamental level, is it aligned with the original teachings of the teacher? If it is not aligned with the original teachings, the farther you are from the original message of Jesus, the more heretical you are, the more nonsensical your teachings are. It just so happened that one such branch became the most popular. One such branch appealed to the Roman Emperor, Constantine, and it became the official religion of the Roman Empire. And even to this day, when people think about Christianity, when they think about Jesus, they cannot shake this image that Catholic Christianity has created of him. They cannot shake their image of Mary that Catholic Christianity has created. When in fact, Jesus and Mary, Yeshua and Miriam, two individuals, spiritual individuals, who lived and spoke about inner realization, whose truth can only be understood through direct experience, they appear to be a branch, a tiny aberration, a deviation from main Christianity. When in fact, what we recognize as mainstream Christianity came about 300 years after the Jesus movement. First 300 years, it was Gnostic Christianity. If you look at the early artworks of Christianity, if you look at the early scriptures of Christianity, early worship traditions of Christianity, they are all inherently Gnostic. It is what we recognize as Eastern Orthodox Gnostic Christianity. But the Christianity the world is familiar with is a structured, organized, totally removed Christianity from the original teachings of Jesus. And we can see the point of disconnection. It begins with Peter. And in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, this divide is beautifully captured because this is a gospel according to Mary and Mary understands Jesus's original message. When she's talking about Jesus and his true teachings, any opposition to her message, especially if it's a strong opposition, it would be recorded because it is her gospel. And we see that the single biggest obstacle would come in the form of Peter. And we get a glimpse of it here. Since you have become the interpreter of the elements and the events of the world, tell us what is the sin of the world. And Peter's questions are always superficial. And they're almost always religious. He has not gone inward one bit to ask a question that is relevant to the individual, that is relevant for spiritual transformation. It is because the question is being asked to Jesus, Jesus understands ultimately what the question is about and he gives an answer that is spiritual. Peter is asking, what is the sin of the world? It's a purely religious question because the idea of sin is in 
the Jewish scriptures. And the entire purpose of a teacher, a Messiah, is to wipe their sins out so that they can become clean and they can go to heaven. And Jesus understands that there is no sin. It is you who make sin exist. There is no sin. When you act according to the habits of your corrupted nature, this is where sin lies. In a single statement, he has shifted the entire focus from the outside to the inside. Now that is the beauty of a teacher. He knows that your life is your own making. You're not living in a cruel, sinful world deliberately created to hurt you. In a way, you are living in a paradise. But whether you live in a paradise or you live in hell depends on how you have understood life, how you have interacted with life. It is your own thoughts. It is your own actions. It is your own desires, fears and frustrations that eventually turns a beautiful paradise into a hellish place. This does not take too much of intelligence to understand. Look at life, look at nature. Wherever there are human beings, where they have gathered in great numbers, you can sense an atmosphere you can experience an atmosphere that is suffocating, that is too noisy, too chaotic. A simple example would be a marketplace where lots of people gather. They're trying to buy, they're trying to sell. Now, if you can put yourself right in the middle of that marketplace, and for a moment, imagine how different that experience is compared to just taking a walk on a beach, looking at the ocean wave, waves, or listening to the songs of birds, or looking at a sunrise, or smelling a flower, or lying on a grass or just sitting and having a simple conversation with another individual, or being in a small group of individuals who know what life is, who don't want anything from you, you don't want anything from them. There is no buying and selling happening. There is just an exchange. You will feel like you are in hell in the middle of that marketplace. That is why you don't live in the marketplace. You go there only when it's necessary. That's why you want to take a break. You want to move away from people. You want to go as far away from human dwellings as possible. That is the whole meaning of a vacation. It is not a vacation if you take your whole market along with you. Right here, we can see there are places that are more hellish and there are places that are more heaven-like. There is no need to imagine another place like heaven and hell. And there's no need to bring in an external idea of sin. You don't need the religious idea of sin, that your birth is sin, because 
you have come through a sinful process. If sex is sin, then everything that comes out of it is also sin. If your birth is sin, then how can you wipe that sin out unless you die? Now, this is the classic religious argument. It is because you're a born sinner, you have to believe in heaven and hell and you have to ask permission from someone else, something else to be granted permission to enter heaven. And there is no way for you to verify if any of this is true. Because in that argument itself, you can see that you cannot ask for proofs. The only way you can ask for proof is by dying. Now, after you die, it's okay. You can come and ask for proof. It is perfectly allowed. But first you have to die. While you're alive, you're a sinner. You have to come to confess your sins, not to ask your questions. That's where sin is relevant. It is useful because it can be used to control people. It can be used as a tool of subjugation. Because it automatically gives someone else power over you. Either you have to possess something that is valuable, that you have discovered for yourself, to share it with people, to gain their love and respect. If you are unable to put in that effort, if you don't want to put in that effort, the simplest, the easiest way to get that reverence, to get that attention, to get to people worshipping you, the simplest way is to make everybody sinners. You turn the whole world into a prison and you claim to be the prison guard. You claim to be the one with authority. Now that is the religious game that had been going on for thousands of years. It did not change with Jesus. In fact, they used Jesus even better. They used his popularity. They used his teachings. They used his message to continue the same religious game. Sin became even more important for Christianity. A lot more important than even for Judaism. In Christianity, sin is the founding principle. Christianity exists to save human souls. Jesus came to save you because you are a sinner. He was sent to atone for your sins. So sin is not a simple idea of right and wrong in Christianity. Sin is a stain on your soul that can only be wiped by God, by His Son. In one statement, Jesus is rubbishing all this. He's saying there is no sin. It is you who makes sin exist. Tell that to the church.